Hey HMS modelers, this is Mike Bartles from the Hydrologic Engineering Center. In this video, we're going to continue discussing losses within HUC HMS by delving into the initial and constant infiltration method. By the end of this lecture, you should be familiar with the initial and constant loss method. I'll present an example computation that should make things super duper clear. We'll also discuss common data sources, parameter estimation techniques, and calibration techniques. And finally, we'll finish up by comparing advantages and disadvantages when using this method. Let's start our discussion by defining how losses are computed when using this method. Within the initial and constant method, all rainfall is lost until an initial loss volume is satisfied. After that volume has been filled, any additional precipitation is lost at a constant rate. Anything that's not infiltrated will become excess precipitation. Simple, right? But I do have to mention up front that there isn't a way to extract infiltrated water when using this method. If you want to do that, you'll have to step up to something a bit more complicated. We'll talk about another option that can do just that within the next video. Let's revisit a figure from a previous lecture. Recall that infiltration has been shown to start at an initially higher rate and decreases exponentially towards an asymptotic limit called the saturated hydraulic conductivity. When using the initial and constant loss method, we only have an initial loss volume, which is the green rectangle in this image, and a constant rate, which is the top of the rectangle in this image, to recreate this exponential curve. As such, you'll typically overestimate infiltration rates at some times, and underestimate infiltration rates at other times in order to provide a good fit throughout the entire simulation time window. When using this method, you're required to supply two parameters, initial loss and constant rate. A directly connected impervious area can also be specified, but it is an optional parameter. However, when a non-zero value for directly connected impervious area is specified, infiltration computations won't be carried out on that portion of the subbasin or grid cells and all precipitation will become excess. And this example here shows how precipitation excess with end loss is computed within this method. In the first time step, half an inch of precip is lost to initial losses. From there on out, precipitation is lost at a constant rate of 0.25 inches per hour. In the next time step, another half inch of precipitation falls, a quarter inch is lost to constant loss, and a quarter inch of excess is generated. In the next time step, one inch of precip falls, 0.25 inches of constant loss is applied, and 0.75 inches of excess is generated. In the next time step, half an inch of precipitation falls, and 0.25 inches is lost due to the constant rate, resulting in 0.25 inches of excess being generated. Then there's a lull in precipitation for four hours. No infiltrated water is extracted because you can't do that with this method. So any additional precipitation is only subjected to the constant loss rate as shown in the remaining time steps. Now let's talk about estimating initial parameter values. When estimating an appropriate initial loss volume, you should scrutinize the prevailing antecedent conditions prior to the start of your simulation. For instance, did it rain a week prior to the start, or has it not rained in several months? Also, how long does it typically take for infiltrated precipitation to be removed from the system through either drainage or evapotranspiration? In this image, a moderate amount of precipitation fell approximately one to two weeks prior to January 1st, which is the start of my simulation. Also, this particular watershed takes several weeks to dry out in between precipitation events. So I should start by using a small initial loss volume because I'd expect there to be a good amount of moisture still within the soil at the start of my simulation. When estimating a constant loss rate for your watershed, remember my recommendation from the previous video. Don't use the actual parameter values from a soils database to estimate this parameter. Instead, get the superficial texture from the soils database and then relate that to publish saturated hydraulic conductivity values for the predominant soils. In this image, over half of the subbasin of interest is covered by salt loam. So a decent place to start would be to use an estimate of the saturated hydraulic conductivity for salt loam and begin calibrating from there. And finally, when estimating a percent impervious area, it's okay to use a GIS source like the National Land Cover Database. You should also include large standing water bodies in these estimates as rain falling directly onto a large lake or a reservoir should not be subject to infiltration. In this image here, percent impervious cover from the NLCD 2016 version is shown. Black areas indicate little to no impervious cover, while magenta areas indicate high degrees of impervious cover. All right, now let's talk about calibration techniques. In calibrating the initial and constant method, I like to start by modifying my initial parameter estimates until I get the initiation of runoff correct. Specifically, 
I'm trying to match the time at which the computed runoff starts to rise when compared to the observed runoff. Then, I try to match the observed runoff volume. In this example, observed flow is shown in black and completed, computed flow is shown in blue. I've matched the time of runoff initiation pretty well, but my initial runoff is too high. So I need to increase my initial loss and or my constant rate. And when calibrating, it's important to use more than just the old eyeball test to gauge whether your model is accurate. Multiple statistical metrics, like the Nash cycle efficiency, are reported in HEC-HMS for locations with observed data. Use all of these to measure model performance as they compare your results from different perspectives. Now let's talk about advantages and disadvantages to this method. And the main advantage of this method is that it's simple. Because it's simple, it's been successfully used all over the world for numerous purposes. The required parameters can be easily estimated from observed data. Also, this method is parsimonious in that a small number of variables or parameters are used to explain something. This allows for easy investigation of model uncertainty, which is an advanced topic that we'll revisit in another video. However, the primary disadvantage of this method is also that it's simple. There's going to be some situations where you just can't predict the infiltration within complicated scenarios using this method because there aren't a lot of predictor variables or parameters. So being simple is a double-edged sword, so to say. So in review, I introduced the initial and constant infiltration method, which is one of the simplest infiltration methods within HEC HMS. It's quick to set up and it's quick to calibrate. As such, it's been used all over the world with a lot of success. However, its simplicity is also a disadvantage for complicated scenarios. In the next video, we're going to focus on the deficit and constant loss method, which is pretty similar to the initial and constant method, but with one major advantage. Infiltrated water can be extracted over time through evapotranspiration. I'll see you then. Thanks for watching.